Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. On today's program, I have a very special message for you. This is part two of Invisible Warfare 101, giving you basic information from God's Word, detailed truth that can help you understand the spiritual warfare that you may be engaged in right now. Now, last week we came to you from the Judean wilderness and we are here again right uh, off of the edge of the Dead Sea. Right across from me is the mountains of uh, Moab, which is, are mentioned extensively in the Old Testament. And we were talking about the Judean wilderness. In fact, directly behind me is the fortress of Masada. So we always want to let you know where we are coming from when we're teaching on location here in Israel. Now, what I want to share with you today, I want to begin with a very unique story. Many years ago in a neighboring state, a minister was called upon to go to a woman's house and pray for her son who was greatly involved with the occult and with drug addiction. And the, the woman said, there are strange things that happen to him and happen in our house and I believe he's possessed by spirits. When the minister went to the house and went, and, 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 and went into the young man's room to pray and he began to rebuke the spirits, the demonic spirit spoke through the young man's voice in a deep male voice and said, you are too full. He said, you've not spent time with God. You have no authority over me. And the minister was completely convicted when he heard that statement. And the minister told the mother, I'll be back in a few days. Don't say anything to him about it. And he went home and told his wife, I'm spending three days with God in fasting and prayer and going back and praying for that young man. Well, the minister did. He spent three days in fasting and prayer, showed up at the house, went back to the room. And when the door was open, the young man who was in the room bound up by demonic power suddenly screamed out. The demonic spirit said, you have been with Jesus. And he cast the spirit out of a young man who was delivered. I remember hearing that story and I was reminded of something in the Bible. You remember Jesus said on one occasion, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. In that incident, he was dealing with an account where he uh, had taken Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, and the other disciples were at the base of the hill, and a father brought his boy who had a spirit in him. It was a spirit of uh, seizures. And the disciples prayed for the young lad and were powerless. Nothing happened. And so the father was very disappointed and very discouraged. And so when the father came to Jesus, Jesus immediately delivered the young man from the demonic spirits that he was under. And then Jesus told his disciples, there was a conversation that went on afterwards, and they said, why couldn't we cast him out? You know, it's kind of odd because if you'll look at the context of the Bible, those disciples had already been given authority over all the powers of the enemy. So why couldn't they cast the spirit out? Well, Jesus simply answered and said to them, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, what did Jesus mean? When he said, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. I can understand the fasting and prayer part. I understand that fasting disciplines your mind. It disciplines your spirit. See, fasting doesn't change God. Fasting changes you. Fasting is like the old flint rock or the rocks that they used to use to sharpen the swords with in the ancient days. Fasting sharpens your spirit. When you fast and you begin to seek God through prayer and fasting, it, it causes the carnal nature to be reduced. It causes the level of unbelief that you're battling to be reduced. It's sort of difficult to explain why it works that way, but I'm telling you, it really does work. But what did Jesus mean when he said this kind? I believe it's possible he was referring to the type of spirit that they were dealing with because there are some spirits more stronger than others. There are some that are weaker and some that are very, very, very strong in their level of authority, which they have. As a matter of fact, Paul talks about this in the book of Ephesians when he says this, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in heavenly places. The principality spirits are the stronger prince spirits that rule over nations and cities and providences, such as you read about in Daniel chapter 10, 
where the prince of the kingdom of Persia and the prince of Grecia were in a conflict in the atmospheric heavens over Babylon. And then you have the powers and the rulers of darkness and wicked spirits in heavenly places. These are still strong spirits, although some of them are on a lesser level than a principality. So the point is simply this, that there are some sicknesses, some spirits, and some problems caused by spirits that that particular spirit doesn't have the level of authority that other spirits have. I want to tell a story, and this is just coming to me while I'm standing here in the Judean wilderness in Israel. My precious father that went home to be with the Lord some time ago began to share with me of a vision that God gave him on one occasion. And in this vision, he saw two demonic spirits. One looked like it was about four and a half feet tall. The other was much taller. Probably, he said, six, six and a half feet tall. He was much taller than the other one. And the, the stronger spirit was looking at the smaller one and saying these words. Why did you let that information get out? I told you to block that information so that the people would not know about it. And the smaller one was looking at the larger one and giving an excuse saying, I did everything I could to block that person from getting that truth, but I couldn't stop it from happening. Dad said in this actual vision which he had, the, the tall demonic power, which was much more stronger in authority than the lesser spirit, said, if you can't do that job, I'll do it myself. And he reached his hand into the stomach area of the smaller spirit. And the smaller spirit began to scream, please, please don't take the authority from me. Please don't take the authority from me. But somehow that smaller spirit had failed in its assignment. And now a stronger demon was being assigned to that particular situation in order to try to make a particular thing take place that had not yet taken place. Now we know that the Bible tells us that if Satan is divided against Satan, his kingdom cannot stand. But in this case, there was no division. It was just the fact that one had failed and now a stronger one was coming. And you know, the Bible says, how can one enter into a strong man's house except he first bind the strong man and then he will enter in and spoil his goods? We do know again that Jesus said this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And it's just like the man of Gadara. Think about this for a moment. This man had 2,000 spirits in Mark chapter 5 in his body. Now the Bible tells us there was a woman in the New Testament. Her name was Mary Magdalene. And it says, Mary Magdalene, of whom Christ had cast out seven devils. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There is a vast difference between an individual possessed by seven devils and someone possessed by 2,000 spirits. Because Mary Magdalene was simply set free by the power of God and delivered. But the man of Gadara, when those 2,000 violent spirits came out of the man, they went into swine, and the swine ran off of a steep place at the Sea of Galilee and were drowned in the sea. Now, there's a real interesting note to be found when you talk about that. The man of Gadara in Mark chapter 5, the Bible said, was crying aloud. He was tormented, crying day and night, cutting himself with stones. Now, actually, when you consider that when the demons went into the pigs, that the pigs drowned in the lake, we would call that today suicide. Well, I, I make a little joke, and maybe I shouldn't, but on the Sea of Galilee, when we, we show people the place where the pigs drown, I call it suicide and not suicide because it was swine. Only people maybe from Arkansas would understand that joke, okay? But our people laugh when I say it because it was a group of pigs. It was not a human being, so what do you call it? Here's the point. When that man is cutting himself with stones, there is a demon power that is real strong in him, don't miss this, trying to get him to take his life. And I believe that when you get to a point, I don't know who I'm talking to now, but I feel led of the Lord to say this. I believe when you get to a point that you want your life to be taken, it is a spirit of hopelessness that you've encountered. And the enemy is trying to cut your life short knowing that God has something better for you. Now, a lot of parents don't realize this. They really don't. And the younger people who hear about this will understand exactly what I'm saying. But there's a group of young people that one of the ways they deal with what they think is their problems and their pain is something called cutting. And it's so interesting that the man of Gadara in Mark chapter 5 was cutting himself with stones, trying to get some kind of, of a relief from the tormenting spirit that was on him. 
And yet the only relief he could really get, ladies and gentlemen, was when Jesus Christ stepped off of that boat and through his presence and power delivered that man. So I don't want you to miss the point of what I'm saying, and that is this. There are different levels of demons. There are different levels of authority in the spirit world. But Jesus Christ has power over all of the power of the enemy. And he said to us, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That word power there is a Greek word for spiritual authority or legal authority. Jesus Christ actually gives the believer a legal right to come against the powers of the enemy and a legal right to tread on and trample over and put the enemy underneath our feet. Now, I want to take a moment while we're talking about this subject because this is a teaching from Israel here in the beautiful Judean wilderness. By the way, Jesus was tempted of the devil according to Matthew 4, Luke chapter 4 in this area of the wilderness because the Judean wilderness in the northern area is right off of the Jordan River and he was baptized in the Jordan and then led by the Spirit into the wilderness which was right just right across from the Jordan River actually to be tempted of the enemy. But I want to talk for a moment about something that is a little bit of a controversial subject, and that is concerning spirits or demon spirits as it relates to people who are Christians. Because there's been a real controversy over the years as to can a Christian be possessed by an evil spirit? Now, I want to, I want to try to take a moment and just delve into this for a few seconds because it is somewhat of a controversial subject. Number one, to answer a question like that, from a biblical theological perspective, can a Christian be controlled or possessed by a spirit? The first thing you have to do is identify what you mean when you say the word Christian. Because there's all sorts of people who call themselves Christians for different reasons. Number one, there are people that if they have Christians in their family ties, or they have family, uh, family members who are Christians, they simply identify themselves as the same. Uh, I went to a Middle Eastern nation years ago. In fact, I'll tell you where it was. It was the nation of Egypt. And when I was there, I would, uh, I, there was men that had the name of John or Mark. You know, if you're, if you're Muslim in the uh, Middle East, you have Muhammad, Abu, Ali. Uh, you use an Islamic name. But these were Christian names. And I said, are you Christians? And they said, yes. I said, where do you go to church? They didn't. I said, have you been baptized in water? They weren't. So in Egypt at that time, if you were not a Muslim, you were automatically just considered to be a Christian. So there are people who have ties to Christians, but that doesn't make them a Christian. This is why before you ever answer the question, can someone who's a Christian be possessed by a spirit, you've got to identify what is a Christian. The second thing is there are some people who are tradition uh, Christians by tradition. I'll give an example. On my mother's side of the family, my great-grandfather was Roman Catholic, and he came from Italy. And uh, a lot of the family members in the north, uh, eastern part of the United States, that's their background. In the Catholic tradition, you may not have gone to Mass, you may not have gone to the confessional for a long time, but because you were born a Catholic, you consider yourself to always be a Catholic. That's the tradition. So you have to ask yourself, is the fact that your family is a certain group or a certain religious group, does that automatically make you a Christian? Of course, those of you who know the Bible says you, you have to know it does not automatically make you a Christian. You become a Christian because of your confession and your belief and your commitment and walk with God. So there is Christians by transformation. Ah, that's the group I want to talk about. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Now, one of the professors at Lee College many years ago in Cleveland, Tennessee, was asked the question, can a Christian have a demon? And I thought his answer was rather profound. He said, a Christian can have whatever a Christian wants to have. And I thought that's a really interesting answer for this reason. Because if a Christian desires to totally follow God, they, they have the will to do so. If a Christian desire, decide, decides, you know what, I know I love the Lord, but I've decided not to follow the Lord from here on. They can will and choose to say, I'm not going to follow the Lord. Now, there is a certain level of protection in the life of a true Christian because the Bible said they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Jesus said, all authority is given to me both in heaven and in earth. I give it unto you. Jesus said, behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. A dedicated, blood-bought, sanctified, saved Christian 
has a certain level of total protection against Satan possessing their spirit. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something that Satan can do. Let me get my notes out here, okay? Number one, Satan can oppress someone who is a believer. Now, the Greek word oppress means to exercise dominion against a person. Acts 10, 38 said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So people can be oppressed of the enemy, and the oppression is when the enemy is trying to dominate maybe your thought life, dominate your thinking, shooting the fiery darts mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6 against your mind. Now, the second thing I want you to understand about a Christian is this. A Christian can be vexed by a spirit. The Greek word vex, this is interesting, means to mob. The implication means to harass or to put pressure on someone and continually harass them with some kind of pressure. For example, if you're living every day under some kind of temptation, you're being vexed of the devil. How do I know that? Because the Bible says in Matthew, Satan, the tempter, came. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. So God's not tempting you. Satan is the tempter. And so when you're under something every day that is a level of temptation, you're under the tempter, meaning you are being vexed of the devil. Temptation on an everyday basis where you have to battle something and constantly cast thing down, things down in your mind, it can be a vexation of the devil because that word can have the implication of meaning to mob or to harass. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits and they were healed and the whole multitude sought to touch Jesus for there went virtue out of him and he healed them all, Luke chapter 6, 18 through 19. However, listen to Matthew 8, 16. When even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Now, the Greek word possessed means to be exercised by a demon. And when someone is possessed, it actually means they're under total dominion and total control of a spirit. In other words, if you were to come across someone that's possessed, they have no control over their own will or even their own thinking. They do things that are totally abnormal. They do things that are off the wall. They say things that are not normal. And I'm not going to go into all the signs from the New Testament. You can find them in Mark chapter 5 that identify when someone is being possessed by an evil spirit. But I will share this with you on the area of something Paul wrote in the Bible. Paul wrote and said that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Therefore, are we to glorify God in our body? If I were to take you back to the temple days, there was an outer court, inner court, and holy of holies. The outer court happens to be represent the body. The inner court represents the soul, and the holy of holies represents the spirit. Now, if you know anything about what I call the progression of God in the temple, you will know that the Israelites were allowed in the outer court, but not the inner court and the holy place. You will know the priests were allowed in the outer court and the inner court, but the Levites were not allowed in the holy of holies. You will discover that the high priest was allowed in the outer court, inner court, and once a year on the Day of Atonement, the Holy of Holies. You will also discover, if you study the Jewish concept of the temple, that the Holy of Holies was so off limit to sin or uncleanness that if the high priest were to go in unfit and drop dead, there was a tradition that says that they would tie a rope to his leg so if something happened to him, he could be pulled out of that Holy of Holies. So. Here's the point I want to make. My body can be sick with spirits of infirmity. The woman in Luke was a daughter of Abraham, and yet she was sick with the spirit of infirmity. Not only can my body be sick by a spirit of infirmity, but my soul can have darts because the soul is the mind. It's the intellect. It's the thinking. It can be under subjection to the fiery darts of the enemy based on Ephesians chapter 6 that try to bring thoughts and evil thoughts into our mind. You know, it's interesting. He didn't say the darts of the enemy. He said the fiery darts of the enemy. And what happens is when your mind burns with a thought or it burns with something that you can't get out of your mind, that's when it's become a fiery dart. But then I have my spirit. Now, God dwells in me. God dwells in my spirit, and the spirit of God dwells in me. Now, I want to suggest this to you based on just how God set up the Holy of Holies and the outer court and the inner court, how he set up the temple, and how the body is a picture of that temple. I want to suggest to you that if the Holy Spirit of Almighty God dwells in my holy place of my spirit, then he will refuse to dwell in there 
with a total, complete, unclean spirit because the law of God in the Old Testament was separate the clean from the unclean, separate the, the good from the bad, separate the sheep from the goat, separate the wheat from the tares. So the Holy Spirit is in such mode of separating that there is no way, both of them couldn't live in the same body. Either the, either the evil spirit has to live in the spirit or God has to live. They can't be the same. But on the other hand, the vexation or the oppression of the enemy can absolutely come into the mind or even the physical, the physical part of a person where those spirits that, that try to attack the body or attack the mind can uh, have to be de uh, uh, exercised by the authority of Christ's name and by the power of the Holy Ghost. So this is part two of the teaching on Invisible Warfare 101.